are we comfortable with AI writing a book? Are we comfortable with AI being a therapist? And we're in that exploration stage where people are figuring out to say, are we? Maybe we're AI and we're just starting you to realize that. That's, that's, I'll, I'll tell you, that's actually interesting because someone brought up, they said they have, they have a passphrase to give their partner whenever there's a major decision because they said, what happens All right. if someone takes my YouTube videos, they right. build a voice model of me and then they call up my wife and say, yes, I need you to send $10,000 to this bank account. Right. Yeah. And it sounds so, like them. They're calling from what looks to be their number. Yeah. And it's possible that technology is off the shelf now. So they say we have a passphrase. So for any major decisions, she's to ask me what that passphrase is, because otherwise AI me shouldn't know it. But if AI, if you write down your passphrase on anything but like a post-it note, I think it is <laughs> AI is going to find it. There you go. I mean, there it's you just, go. Then it, we're, then it we're becomes lost. part of that model. Uh, well, thank you again today on The Unknowns, as you've been just listening to this amazing conversation already. Neil Hoyne, who's the chief strategist at Google, author of Converted, The Data-Driven Way of Two Win Customers' Hearts. Uh, he has been on the show before. Great understanding of AI, obviously, and everyone seems to be talking about AI. Of course. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I got to tell you, it, I love magic. And I love good magic and bad magic and all magic. And then when I tried Google's VO, it was like magic. Like, that is. tell me how this works. I'm giving all the trade secrets, every proprietary secret <laughs> Every single thing. Can. And, and, into, and a, go. into a half hour. Yeah. No, I just, I, it, what's going on? Like, it's just, it seems to me that this uh, AI synthetic, my son calls the whole thing clankers. It's kind of funny. Um, but it seems to be evolving very rapidly. It is. And, and it's, well, here's, here, I'll give you the sense. Here's, here's how it works. Let's simplify it down. I don't want to remove the magic by revealing the trick, but by understanding the basics, it starts to piece together the intuition, which is these models, whether we're talking about text or video or pictures are pattern matching. Let's take a look at a whole bunch of things and try to make sense. But we're not necessarily going in and saying, Today, we're going to teach you what fingers look like, or I think Will Smith eating spaghetti was one of the common benchmarks for video. We're going to let these models figure it out, which means they can scale to all the data that's out there. They don't need somebody in there saying, today, we're going to learn this subject or that subject. Now, you load all this data in. This is where this great appetite of AI companies for data comes in, because the more data you have, the more patterns you can tease out the more specificity you have. And so you go from those and you have all these patterns. Now, then what you end up with is you end up with gaps. Now, some of these gaps are unintentional. We Maybe we didn't load in enough data. Other cases, it's, hey, these models are behaving in ways we didn't expect. Now, you can certainly go right, rerun these and try to build different patterns and different models. That's where you see the large changes happening when models go from three or four to five. But you also have to remember that behind the scenes of these models, oddly enough, is a very large human component, which are individual humans saying something was wrong about those models. So let's provide that model a different set of instructions. So Provide it, it, this level of encouragement. Don't so, talk about this subject. Yeah, so, I mean, it's like... Um... AI, go play, right? We're going to yeah. give you access, go play. And so you're saying like human mentors in a way are like saying, uh, 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 we have five and fingers, that's, not six. That's, that's exactly what it is. And now and then, uh, either through unintentional leaks or because they're able to get the AI models to reveal them across companies. And these are interesting. I was looking at one from Anthropics Claude. These instructions are released. And there's a certain irony behind it because people talk about AI replacing humans. And here you have human beings behind the scenes working to make those AI models better. But what people have to realize is a lot of people go through and they're like, AI is thinking. AI is understanding. No, AI is simply looking at all the data, how you and I interact, how maybe we write our emails or how we present content and saying, you know what? Let's see if I learned enough watching Charlie to be 
a convincing version of Charlie, a great interviewer, a great person, and then AI behaves accordingly. So the thing that fascinates me about invention and technology, you know, like when they invented the wheel, right? The wheel is still around, right? It's like they got it right the first time. Now there's been variations, yeah. optimizations of the wheel, different ingredients, et cetera, but it's still a wheel. It is. I think this is, we're onto something new, right? Every day it's something, there's some available new uh, impressive thing AI seems to do. To your point, there are humans that are mentoring it. But here's the big question. Is there a time when AI is like, <laughs> we got it. We learned everything. That that becomes a question then to say, can AI learn something if there's no data behind it? So at least in the current iteration, it doesn't have a sensory understanding of the world that we do. I spent uh, some time earlier this week at the Culinary Institute learning Mexican food. And we follow the recipe, right, as given, mix this at this part, and something's still off in the dish. And as it turned out, it was where the sausage or the chorizo was sourced from. And it took a chef to be able to taste that and now to say, okay, here's how I would correct for that problem. But you would imagine AI, would AI just follow the recipe? How does it get the additional inputs? Equally, when presenting to someone, uh, AI may have a script or a narrative. We've all seen presenters on stage. They read the narrative, but they can't read the audience. How the audience is responding, how they react. Does AI not only have a sensor to manage, I could imagine a camera could look at the audience, but does it have the intuition and the backing to respond? Has anybody ever commented on that? Or do we simply see the results of the production? We see the movie, the completed work. And so what it really challenges us with any invention, I think AI is a large invention because of the impact that it can have. But you're right. The wheel came out there. Uh, our CEO, Sundar, was on 60 Minutes saying that this may be as important, as impactful as fire. And we always think about it. When fire came out, I imagine thousands of years ago in a cave, it's likely that somebody burned their food. It's likely that somebody died of carbon monoxide poisoning. They burned all their possessions. And then they learned the rules and they said, okay, we have to contain this. This is how we treat it. These are the unintended consequences of working with this. And fast forward to the modern day. We have flammability standards for buildings. We have emergency exit procedures. We have sprinklers to say, we can use this technology in a responsible way. We are at that stage as, as I would say, almost humanity of figuring out how do we apply AI? Are we comfortable with AI writing a book? Are we comfortable with AI being a therapist? And we're in that exploration stage where people are figuring out to say, are we? Yeah, and there's I, papers on both sides. One say, yes, it makes it more accessible. There was a paper last week that said, no, it actually can encourage harmful behaviors if prompted in a particular way. And so we're learning. I love, I love your analogy about fire standards and society coming together for the community good to prevent harm. Yes. And I, and I don't want to discuss this because there's other people discussing this, but it doesn't seem like governments around the world are gathering around this and saying, hey, you know, let's have some standards here. And while this is going on, AI is like, okay, I'll just keep going on. And I don't, I, I don't want to be saying anything like, but it, it, I, does the, is it, is it just human nature to like keep pushing exploration? And that's what's pushing this pure curiosity, right? Or just pure understanding of, of what this could do. But to your point, where is the sort of movement that's going to come in and put fire codes on this as needed? Well, that's, that's exactly the question. On the one hand, you could see the government saying, and let's use a fire analogy until we exhaust it and then we never bring it up again. But you go through and you say, as a government, we're responsible for developing these standards. As we have flammability standards, we will develop AI standards and we're going to move quickly. And then you have an industry at large saying, okay, um, <laughs> do we stop? Dude, can we, can we use the fire thing still or, or what do we do? And that's, that's the push and pull with progress. And every society will deal with this in a different way. And so I don't think there's an answer to say you slow technical progress while you wait for the guardrails. Um, I think the answer is more in 
that the more people that are involved in the discussions from individuals using AI to companies, there's companies, um, Amazon, if you use AI in your books, you have to report it. That's them instilling their own sense of regulations to say, this is how we believe we can responsibly handle this technology all the way to the government level. And I think with things moving so quickly, what we see is we wish for that steady state, right? We wish to be like, can this just calm down so we know these are the rules? Universities, do you let your students use AI knowing that they'll have it in the workforce? Or do you avoid it because it diminishes the ability for teachers to understand, is a student actually grasping this content? And there's arguments on both sides. What we're lacking is best practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, does and, a student learn better and, or worse? What's and, the role of a teacher? And maybe that has to come from industry to a point, right? I mean, you've got uh, my son and I grapple with between Croc or ChatGTP on image generation. Right? We send each other funny things during the day, right? Now, ChatGTP has, well, well, wait, that's a political figure. We can't alter his appearance. Where Croc's like, keep going. Right. Yep. Who cares? So it, it may be this sense of the industry coming back, uh, coming together and setting to your point standards. Right. Said, yeah. Setting standards. And I'd also say that, you know, there was a question one time where someone said, should we expect absolute truth from AI? Now, here's a provocative question. We won't go into a possible answer, but what if you could go and what if you had the most advanced, always truthful AI and you go and you say, who should I vote for? Tell me. Now, if you have that type of system, now what, what do we lose with that type of system? Mm -hmm. Sure. We lose the ability to think for ourselves, to evaluate, to make our own decisions, to look beyond perhaps a data set. And so a question has been raised around when it comes to images and videos. Do you try to constrain where you say everything you see online is truthful and accurate representation? It is a picture from real life or not. Or instead, does society have to move to say, we're going to teach people to be critical of what you see? Then when you look at something, not to simply accept it as truth. And, and there's arguments, again, on both sides. That's that steady state we haven't found, which is to say, we don't have those critical thinking skills yet. But my children, when they're looking online, we're very conscious to tell them, just because you see a picture of something doesn't mean it's, it's true. This is a lesson I never had at their age. As you look at young kids coming out of college, what advice would you give them? So first of all, we have to acknowledge that the problem is real, right? We see that in the data and in the numbers. And the question is how you want to approach it. Now, the first tier is that I think a lot of the students that I've met took jobs and disciplines that they weren't necessarily interested in, but were safe, right? You go to college and you say, this field always has job openings. So I will go into this field. The gap, I think, of where AI is today and the people that are getting hired is really that passion and that intuition, what AI cannot do. So if you go into, say, a computer science program, I've met some computer science graduates who have a wonderful understanding of every lesson that they've learned. But they don't love the field. They don't tinker with the field. They don't try to go beyond what their curriculum taught them. And so what we're actually finding is that a lot of the curriculums, I would argue, are outdated for what's necessary. What people really need is they need that experience to say, you may have learned how to code. Seek out people that can tell you what does that process look like internally for developing the standards and the vision of that product? How do you respond to customer needs and interactions? How do you talk to other teams to make progress? And what even the engineers that I work with at Google will tell you, they come into the job thinking coding is 80% of the job. And for some of them, they're like, it's actually really close to 20%. It's a lot of those skills of understanding how the world and the people act. Those are the gaps where AI is, where AI is not. AI cannot tell you how to bring these companies together. Now, there is that difficult problem where people going into college, I would say you want to lean in on those skills, the gaps that AI cannot address, as opposed to just the raw technical skills. But at the same time, this message has to be heard by leaders of industry to say, for all the companies that are out there saying, you know what, we're going to cut costs and cut junior employees. I said, well, okay, well, where are you going to get the advanced ones from? 
And I've seen leaders on both sides of this. I've seen some that say, my responsibility as a leader is to minimize costs, deliver value back to shareholders. That's my job. I met another gentleman who said, my job is not only to do that stuff, but realize that part of it to ensure the stability of our company is that I need to hire junior programmers knowing that AI can do their job because if I don't train them, they don't have the skills to become our more senior developers. And so this is a future proofing strategy for us and a responsibility, which comes to the larger question that we're forced to ask ourselves as leaders and in students, what are we delivering that's valuable to this world? Is it that we're making emails and PowerPoint decks? And that if AI replaces that, we lose our value or very similar to where we started, this idea of creating things, creating things where there's not a data set, a viewpoint or a sensor to measure it, but to say the world needs this. And in which case AI is there to accelerate it, where we can go from an idea and instead of having to raise money to be able to build a quick prototype over a weekend that shows that it's possible. And so it's really those questions to say, what really makes us people, what makes us valuable, and how do we contribute back? And if all the garbage falls by the wayside, I'll be happy. Neil, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Yeah, and pleasure. look forward to talking to you again.